Human Rights for the Uyghurs here on Global Connections with Henrik Sadzuski. Did I get that right, Henrik? I very close. Sadzuski. Ah, uh, it wasn't all that close. <laughs> uh, you know, I've had some uh, some ones that are a little way off there. <laughs> Okay, that's a Polish name, but uh, actually Henrik was um, educated in the UK, and he's here in uh, Hilo at the UH, uh, just finished his PhD, and we are happy to have him on the show to talk about his experience with and his perceptions about China and the Uyghurs, um, you know, and other human rights violations, I think. Henrik, welcome to the show. So nice to have you here. Jay, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on. So let's talk about you first a little bit. Uh, you've completed your PhD uh, at UH in Hilo. What, what subject? What was uh, your dissertation about? Um, well, so um, I was actually, I was in Manoa, um, but uh, we, we have a family home on the big island. So, uh, you know, Honolulu real estate prices drove me back um, onto the big island. So I completed my, uh, my PhD here. And uh, my my work um, for the U, for UH Manoa was focused on um, Chinese migrants and Chinese presence in Fiji. Of course, Fiji. But what you know what that what that opens up to me is that you have Chinese migrants and Chinese presence everywhere in the world. So mm -hmm. I, I suggest Henrik that you have a lot of additional um, PhDs to write. Well, absolutely, and, uh, and that's just even focused on the Pacific. So my my next uh, my next idea is to expand the work out of Fiji into other other parts of Oceania. That will totally justify your PhD, and that's only chapter one, because the, <laughs> the world is your oyster, proverbially. Uh, so uh, uh, we we will talk about the Uyghurs, but before we do that, I want to talk about an article that you're collaborating with uh, involving a missing student. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, so, I mean, this uh, this was published as, a, as an op-ed uh, in the Star Advertiser in conjunction with two other um, UH Mano employees um, well, and faculty. Uh, this was an individual um, who was, uh, Zulpikar is his name. He graduated out of the sociology department at UH Manoa and uh, returned to to China and particularly to Xinjiang, um, the northwestern part of uh, of China where where Uyghurs reside. He went with the idea of using his PhD to um, further, you know, the, or to educate the next generation of Uyghurs. Anyway, in the in the most recent um, intensification of uh, of the repression, he's since disappeared. And um, uh, the last known uh, whereabouts, you know, we're talking sort of 2017, 18, and uh, it's it's thought that he went into one of the camps that were created at that time. The retraining camps. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a lot of ways that uh, that people have um, called these camps. I think there uh, most people outside of China would call these concentration camps. And in China them, it, itself, the state and the government refer to it as uh, vocational and training centers. A complete with torture, am I right? Yeah, I mean, the, these centers are really, I mean, they've, they've swept up uh, vast numbers of Uyghurs. Uh, scholarly like, and peer reviewed work has put the number between 1.1 and 1.5 million. Uh, Uyghurs, it put that into context, there are roughly about 10 million Uyghurs in the entire region. And um, I think that a lot of the Uyghurs who were put into these camps were for such minor infractions as uh, religious expressions or having some sort of overseas connection. Mm, that's, that's chilling. Uh, now, now, in the case of uh, this, this uh, student, you think he's in a camp, or could he be completely disappeared? And when I say completely disappeared, I mean killed. Well, the range of op options are out there. I mean, it, 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 as you say, there, there's a chilling aspect to these camps, and uh, intellectuals who have gone into these camps uh, have disappeared. Um, and particularly, I can think of a couple of religious scholars um, who, I mean, of course, they were elderly, and uh, so they were much more vulnerable to the conditions of the camps. Died in those facilities. Um, in, ter in, you know, in Zulpikar's case, we don't really know. Um, it's quite possible he's been released. It's quite possible he's um, 
been moved out of the camp system and imprisoned, uh, or maybe one of the maybe remaining within the camp system itself, perhaps also working within forced labour too. So what that tells us mostly is that we're dealing with a real dearth of information to the extent that even relatives outside of China uh, have little to, to no idea of what's happening to their relatives. So they don't know where he is. They don't know um, what he's doing in whatever facility he's in. And, and they have no idea when he's going to get, get out again. Um, that's very troubling. Well, absolutely. I mean, of course, you know, this has all kinds of due process um, implications and China's obligations to international standards, um, not only just in um, jurisprudence, but I think that what we have here is a situation that um, it's an individual from Hawaii, but we can magnify this out to um, many Uyghurs out there particularly in the diaspora who have no idea where their family members are, or if they do have some sort of contact, it's under conditions of coercion, um, meaning that authorities are, are overlooking you know, the, the sort of shoulders of, uh, of their relatives whilst they have these communications. Well, he has uh, contact with people in Hawaii, including you, and I'm a rather he had contact with people in Hawaii. Um, but question, what can you do about it? How, what, what steps can you take to try to get him out, out of there and to bring him back here? Well, uh, yeah, this again is uh, you know, an ongoing uh, campaign that uh, particularly since the re repression of 2017 um, that intensified. I mean, this has been a culmination of several years of, of pressure. And um, personally, uh, of course, what we do um, as scholars is try to assemble the scholarly community and uh, to try to advocate for his case. Um, and, uh, but at the end of the day, the, uh, the discretion is with the Chinese state. Pressure, shaming, these are the ways that um, we use as individuals and, and as collective groups. But there are broader structurally legislative things that we can put in place, which are not always directly related to the persecution of intellectuals, but some of the other issues that are out there um, for example, forced labor has been an issue that the United States has taken up quite um, enthusiastically in trying to limit import and exports um, from particularly Xinjiang, imposing sanctions on, on officials complicit in the, um, in the repression. So at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's at the more the action is more about systemic um, uh, advocacy rather than um, on these individual cases. We can when you do what say, we can. When you say advocate, you're talking about advocating with the Chinese government rather than the US government, or is it both? Um, well, di I mean, I think directly, if you're, if you're talking to the Chinese government, it falls on deaf ears. Uh, the, the Chinese government's narrative is mm -hmm. completely different, um, as, as you could well expect. The, the idea of uh, the vocational and training centers is actually a what what the Chinese government calls a de-extremification move. They're they're making Uyghurs less radical. So a lot of what um, can be done has to be done overseas um, in terms of uh, looking at China's global connections. How those, those are vulner places of vulnerability, but it it needs to be done through either multilateral organizations or, or sovereign governments. Mm, mm, shaming included. So um, you live there in uh, in uh, uh, Xinjiang. You live there, and and you you've had a personal experience with the way this works. Yeah, I mean, I, so I lived there from 1994 to 1997. I lived in the city called Kashgar, which is in the very southwest of the region. Um, Xinjiang is vast. I mean, it's the size of Alaska, and uh, you know, it takes up about one sixth of the the, the Chinese territory. So I was in the very, very southwest, um, quite near the borders of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Tajikistan. It, Kashgar is, uh, is a real cultural hub for Uyghurs. It, it has a very significant spiritual and, and emotional meaning for Uyghurs as a sort of center of Uyghurness. I was there from 94 to 97. And I think that most scholars would say that 97 is when you start seeing the real um, intensification of uh, of the repression. So I was there in a period where 
um, I could see discrimination um, on the ground, but also some of the government systemic ways that impacts Uyghurs too. So those were those were my three years there working at uh, Kashgar Teachers College. Mm. Henrik, can you go back? Uh, I can't. No. Um, I mean, I. I'm assuming I can't. I'll put it that way. I haven't, I haven't actually applied for a visa, um, and my name is attached to enough research that's critical of the policies in Xinjiang that I doubt um, the likes of, uh, of critical researchers and scholars are, are wanted anymore in, in Xinjiang. Uh, it, it's a shame, of course. Um, I think that we need to have uh, a lot more of those you know, boots on the ground taking a look. Um, and, I, and in fact, I think the Chinese government's policies would be better informed by a number of people who have expertise and who have different perspectives. But certainly um, the other aspect of going back, though, is that my, my fear is, is that let's say everything happened and the planets aligned, I was allowed to go. Anybody I talked to, I think, would uh, would have some sort of consequence once I left the area. So I think that there's a personal and ethical um, reason not to go back. Mm -hmm. So let's talk for a minute about the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are Muslim, but they're Chinese. Mm -hmm. How did how did uh, Islam get into uh, an an area the size of Alaska in China? Um, did they did these people come from the Middle East? Uh, you know the, the the seat of Islam, or did Islam come to them? And when? Yeah, I, I mean, Islam came came to the Uyghurs around about the 10th century. Um, prior to that, uh, Uyghurs were either you know, Nestorian Christians or Manichaeans or Buddhists. And a lot of the fame of the historical fame of, uh, of Xinjiang comes from the Silk Road cities that were trading posts. So uh, Islam came to them. Uh, they, I think that most Uyghurs would um probably not agree with the idea that they're chinese i think that they would say that they're chinese citizens um it, you know format inform, formally on their on their passports however i think that their most of their identity lies within the turkic world so looking across the borders to places like kazakhstan uzbekistan uh kyrgyzstan as well uh, and turkey as well being another um sort of cultural cousin so uh, there, it, it's a really uniquely placed uh, region in that it has this sort of conduit over to into Eurasia, South Asia, Central Asia, and uh, and it's as a result is strategically key. Um, but their their influences are manifold, and uh, currently they they are Muslims um, and uh, and have been, and I think that uh, a vast number of Uyghurs would equate their ethnic identity with being Muslims. But that, that's not to say there aren't, there aren't um, uh, numbers of Uyghurs who are secular or believe in other religions. Mm. I wonder if that helps them in dealing with the Chinese government, that they can say, wait, stop, stop surveilling me. Don't take me away to a training camp. I am secular. Does that help? Not really, no. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, in the early days of this, I mean, I'm calling this the sort of real intensification of the repression, 2017. Prior to that, there was this, uh, you know, perhaps campaign influenced uh, assaults on, on Islam. But after 2017, it was quite widespread. So the early days, if you were, you know, if you were praying or if you received some sort of religious education outside of the formal system, this was enough to, to land you in a camp. However, um, particularly in a study that um, I did and with other members of my organization on Uyghur intellectuals, uh, I mean, at the last count, we were able to document 312 of those intellectuals who have been detained uh, or imprisoned. There are many of those individuals were almost models of the state, uh, secular in mind uh, and, or, and praised prior to 2017. Since that time, that hasn't saved them from the camps. It, it almost amounts to a criminalization of, um, from, of ethnicity. Hmm. Now, when you say ethnicity, I mean, is it, is it cultural or is it also racial? Uh, it sounds to me like this was on the Silk Road. It mm -hmm. sounds to me like plenty of traffic uh, to and from China over a thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, so, so query whether these people are, you know, Chinese in the full mm, racial racial sense, uh, or whether they're a mixed bag in terms of, uh, uh, you know, their origins on the Silk Road. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's a, there's been mountains of books written about the you know how did the Uyghurs get to be Uyghurs, and and a lot of the um, recent scholarship talks about how Soviet national policy influenced the Chinese to group the Turkic Muslims of uh, uh, of this part. They, I mean, many Uyghurs would call this Eastern Turkestan, and uh, Western Turkestan being places in the Soviet Union like Kazakhstan and so on. Uh, I think that yes, there has been a, a vast number of influences, and their language is a real um, gateway into understanding that. If you look at if you look at Uyghur, has influences from from Persian, from Arabic, from uh, obviously the Turkic languages, and more recently from Chinese too. Um, I, however, I think that if you were to talk to a Uyghur about self-identifying, I think that they would distance themselves from the dominant Han culture quite clearly. And, and it's very much an aspect of the current assimilation policy uh, in that the, the Chinese government would like to Hanify or Sinify Uyghurs, um, making sure that uh, Mandarin is their first language. And, uh, and I think that there's uh, plenty of resistance to that. So, um, so I think that they're, um, there, at this point, I think that there is this sort of identity uh, conflict going on internally and also on the ground. You know, it reminds me of uh, uh, Falun Gong, although it's an imperfect comparison. Uh, can you compare, contrast the experience of members of the Falun Gong in China uh, with the Uyghurs? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's, um, yeah, there have been a number of points where uh, Falun Gong have had uh, a, a similar experience in terms of being uh, their their religious expressions being being closed down. And um, for Uyghurs, as I said, there there are real two very core aspects of their identity that uh, that are asserted as different from the Han Chinese. One is language, and one is religion. And uh, and religion has been heavily suppressed, and that has happened prior to two thousand and seventeen. Um, and so I think that the Falun Gong experience too is uh, is similar in that way that there's this belief system separate from the state, and uh, and what I what I see and I think many other scholars see is that these external affinities outside of the state or outside of the Communist Party are a threat to the to the control that the state likes to exert over its citizens. Mm. You know, um, there was a movie three four years ago around the same time as the 2017 intensification you mentioned, uh, where this uh, fellow was, um, was Falun Gong, um, and he was taken to a training camp. The, the movie was a real movie. It was a documentary called Letters from Masangia. Uh, mm -hmm. It was popular because uh, he wrote little letters and put them in the Christmas toys that were being sent to the U.S. Um, and a woman uh, received a Christmas toy. She published it uh, in the newspaper in Seattle, I think, and and then she wound up feeling badly that she had uh, undermined his position in the camp there, and she went to try to help him. Uh, uh -huh. In the in the end, the Chinese intelligence caught him and killed him. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> bottom line, though, is that uh, there is a, a haunting comparison between the rend you know the the uh, re rendition of uh, the the punishment in Masangia uh -huh. as as uh, the training camps you're talking about uh, uh -huh. in near uh, Xinjiang. And by the way, are the camps these facilities in or near Xinjiang, are they somewhere else in China? Uh, they are, they're predominantly in, well, they're predominant, they are in Xinjiang. Um, and uh, the, you know, the, the, it's interesting you bring up this link of forced labor. Uh, there is a very clear pathway between camp and forced labor. Uh, forced labor is also a way of, of transferring Uyghurs to other parts of China. And there have been um, credible reports of Uyghurs transferred to places in northeastern China um, as cheap labor pools. So, yeah, there, you know, some of the ways to think about this is that China's competitive competitiveness on the world market is being somewhat undermined, mainly because labor is becoming more expensive, and uh, and I think that Uyghurs are being uh, used in a way um, to provide the, a cheaper labor pool making Chinese manufactured products much more competitive, right? Um, however, I mean, I think that the, the those movements of, of Uyghurs, uh, I mean, it amounts to a pool that sometimes are advertised even online. You know, we have 200 Uyghurs, 
does your factory need these people, you can purchase this and transfer them to to your facility. So I, I think that there, it, you know, it's bound up with also the economics um, and uh, and also the challenges that China is facing in terms of a slowing economy, but also the way it's thinking globally as well. Mm. If I were a Uyghur person in Xinjiang and I woke up one Monday morning and said, "Yeah, I'd like to get out of here," um, I don't. I, don't, I appreciate uh, the family, the religion, what have you, the community here, but I want to go to Shanghai. I, I can make more money in Shanghai. My options are much greater in the business community there. Uh, why can't I just stand up and walk out and go to Shanghai? Will Will there be some obstacle? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, the the Chinese hukou system, um, meaning that you have to register and have a formal um, residency in a, uh, you have to transfer your residency from one part of the China of where you're living now into a, into the the new place that you want to go. Um, that is extraordinarily difficult, particularly for Uyghurs. It has a racialized element, um, even travel itself without the um, desire to relocate um, is difficult enough. Hotels are either um, forbidding Uyghurs to stay there, um, or if they do, then everything has to be registered, your movements have to be monitored, um, and places in China themselves have dedicated Xinjiang offices, which are designed to monitor that kind of movement. So no, I mean, in some, um, getting up moving and going over to other city i mean i'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility it's it, it certainly is very difficult mm. you know uh, uh 2017 the intensification let's call it for this discussion uh, xi jinping was the um president mm -hmm. and uh, and and the question is uh, is does he carrying a certain part of the burden here is he responsible for the intensification uh and then my next question to you henrik is going to be why What's the problem? Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, it, it has to go all the way to the top, um, without a shadow of a doubt, in my, in my, in my opinion. Uh, I think that um, Xi Jinping in recently leaked documents has talked about how um, the, the Uyghur problem needs to be dealt with. Yeah, and, uh, and I think that officials uh, have of course, as you go lower down the chain, I think intent that gets intensified. So, in, in order, you know, meaning that the lower officials need to pl please the hierarchy. So it gets a lot more uh, intense as you go down. So, uh, you know, Uyghurs being called enemies, um, Islam being referred to as a contagion, and uh, and I think Xi Jinping's also his signature policy of the of the Belt and Road Initiative is one where he. Um, uh, sees Xinjiang as a pivot, as important, and that it has to be cleansed um, so that that policy, um, his legacy, in fact, um, is not impeded by by these by these people. So um, I would say that yes, um, I think that we we have to look to the top. Also, there's a, an entire system that is um, that looks upward in order to please and meet those expectations. Mm. This is a problem in an autocracy. Mm. Um, you know, one, one thing that uh, strikes me is this is a tantamount to, uh, see if you agree, tantamount to cultural genocide. In other mm. words, that over the years, it would appear uh, that the ultimate uh, goal of this initiative to, you know, um, uh, change the, the way they, they, they live um, is uh, tantamount to cultural genocide. You, you want to stamp out um, Islam. You mm. want to make them into Han Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to bring them into the fold and have the next generation not know anything about it. Mm. Um, would you disagree with my characterization? Well, I, you know, I think that, um, in my opinion, what, there's nothing I disagree with with what you're saying. I think that the, the cultural dimensions are... Uh, are in play and have been for several years. I think that the, uh, you know, the erosion of Islam and the erosion, particularly of the language in the education system, um, is is well documented. I think where a lot of people's minds are now is on a broader definition of genocide. Um, in December 2021, an independent Uyghur tribunal. Um, found China to um, be committing genocide um, through its coercive birth control policies. And a number of governments, too, have uh, made genocide uh, determinations, including the United States. 
Now, some might argue that those are, you know, embedded in the political relationships that go on with China. Um, however, I think that the scholarly uh, 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 research that backs up that the the poly, uh, that the Uyghur population is being targeted for um, for family planning uh, policies in the, with the aim of reducing the po the population, which is one of the one of the articles in the Genocide Convention, is in play. Oh, where is this going? I mean. I mean, none of this is a surprise in the sense that we have known for several years, you know, that there was this uh, horrible uh, repression of Uyghurs and everything Uyghur uh, in in China. Um, but where is it going? Are, are they succeeding in this effort? Uh, that that is the government. Um, and where is it going to wind up? Will will they succeed in stamping out Uyghur, Uyghur Uyghurs and Uyghurisms and, and uh, the cultural and in fact population of Uyghurs? Uh, is that where it's going? And and the second part of my question is, what, if anything, is, is, is being done to stop this? Um, because it is, is, it, it is a, 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 you know, a human rights outrage. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that uh, to, to address the first question, we're, we're at a very critical point, right? And it sort of leads into the second question about what can be done, because now is the time to do it, right? And, um, and I think that the, the first aspect to this is that, um, in the Chinese disinformation and the propaganda that we see, Uyghurs have been uh, retooled, right? They have been remade as productive citizens, de-extremified um, in their in their words. And we have this new, clean Xinjiang ready for investment. Um, of course, you have the diaspora who are interpreting their own identity in different ways and also being very vibrant in particularly cultural ways. What can be done? Um, states, multilateral organizations are, are working hard on this. I think that we see um, in the US key legislation that's been put in place that, um, as I said, imposes sanctions, but also you know, incorporates the State Department to report um, on, the, on the situation. Civil society is also a key aspect to this. You and I can do things. There are many, many, many options. I, I would encourage people to go to the uh, Uyghur Human Rights um, pay, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Project page that is called um, What You Can Do. And there are eight very key things um, right there that just you and I can do today. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you for the common denominator, common to what the Chinese are doing with the Uyghurs and Falun Gong for that matter, um, and uh, their position on Ukraine. Mm. There's, there's a common government, political, maybe cultural, denominator here that we should discuss. Are you, can you address that? Yeah, China is, yeah, is obviously uh, has made this a very important strategic alliance with Russia. And, uh, and then the next thing we know um, is that, uh, of course, after the Olympics, and it seems like Putin and Xi may have had an agreement that the uh, invasion go ahead after the Olympics so that China could have its moment. But I think that where, where the key here is that there's an issue of sovereignty. China's main foreign policy thrust is about sovereignty. And, uh, and the fact that they have not come out forcefully to say Ukrainians have deserve a right to their sovereignty and um, puts them in quite a difficult situation. If that is the case, I think that with Uyghurs, Tibetans, Southern Mongolians, other captured nations within China, may also see, well, we have our rights to self-determination too, um, particularly under the UN Charter. So uh, it would be interesting to see where, where China goes at this point. I'm, um, I think that at, at this present moment, they are somewhat sitting in the fence, but still putting out the disinformation that is coming out of Russia. Yeah, one thing you mentioned I'd like to follow up on, and, that, and that's the Olympics. Uh, something outrageous happened with respect to the Olympics. Can you talk about it? Yeah, well, I mean, the the uh, the fact that the Olympics went ahead in uh, in February of this year, when there is an, an ongoing genocide in that country, um, really puts the IOC in a position of complicity. Um, Thomas Bach and other senior members of the IOC uh, who denied, I mean, some, there's one member of that committee, Dick Pound, who actually said, I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about Uyghurs, which I find alarming. 
that a senior member of the International Olympic Committee could not know anything about what's going on in a country where the Olympics is being hosted. So I, I you know, of course, it's it, it, the parallels with with Berlin are right there. Um, history, I think, is going to be the main determinant. Um, but what drove that Olympics, obviously, was uh, was money and also a China that is now projecting itself on a global stage. Henrik, you mentioned InterAlia, um, an organization that you were involved with uh, that deals with these issues. What's the name of the organization and how can I read up on it? Yeah, uh, that's the Uyghur Human Rights uh, Project. Um, I've, uh, I've actually worked there since 2008. Um, so I feel like a veteran of, uh, of working there. And it's, it's uh, an organization that does research-based advocacy website is uh, uhrp.org and there's lots of information on our research and uh, and the kinds of information that i've shared today particularly about what you can do and what's happening across the globe in terms of advocacy and how you know just how we can get involved as people and sit as citizens um and that organization um you know just is doing that sort of hard work of uh, of trying to document um all of these incidents that are that we that we've discussed today Henrik, you are an activist and you are a great asset to Hawaii. Hawaii needs to be aware of these things and you're part of the intellectual structure that makes us aware. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for helping us uh, understand these things. And I hope we can circle back at a later time because I know there will be further events and issues along the same lines. Uh, and it's important from a, an international point of view, especially now. Let me well, try one more time, Henrik, to pronounce your last name. Sadowski. Shajewski. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for opening this forum up um, to Hawaiians uh, to be able to learn about Uyghurs and engage with the issue. It, it's important to us. Um, and it, it's important to us on so many reasons in that China is targeting US citizens uh, who, are, who are Uyghurs. Um, also, their, their surveillance technologies are beginning to become a globalized issue, um, and I think that uh, we can certainly engage as Hawaiians. It's been my, my honor and pleasure to, to talk to you today. Thank you, Henrik. Henrik Sajewski, I think I got it now. You certainly did. <laughs> uh, aloha, Henrik. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.